we can use our calculator to do 30 times 9.8. 30 times 9.8 is 294. And then 9 plus 294 is 303. Now notice that this is not the final velocity. Um, the final velocity is not 303, it's the final velocity squared that's 303. So we still have to figure out what the final velocity is by getting it by itself. We've got to get rid of the square on the left-hand side. How can we get rid of the square? Well, we always use the do the opposite technique. What's the opposite of squaring something? The opposite of squaring something is taking the square root. So we're going to take the square roots of both sides. Let's move our work up to here. So um, what happens when we take the square root of the left-hand side? Well, that gets rid of the square, and we're left with v final y. And now we have to take the square root of the right-hand side. And now we have to think about an issue that we've mentioned um, a couple of times previously um, in this series of videos and also in the previous series on general one-dimensional motion. Um, there's really two square roots. There's the positive square root and there's the negative square root. So we better figure out, are we taking the positive square root or the negative square root? In some problems, you need to pay attention to both roots, and in some problems, you should only pay attention to one. Well, what did we expect to get in this problem? Well, we know that when we hit the ground, we're going to be moving down. We've already said that on the downward path, our velocity is down. We know we're going to be moving down on the uh, downward path. And we know that down is our negative direction. We chose up as the positive direction. So actually, we should ignore the positive square root here. And we should only pay attention to the negative square root. You don't always pay attention to the positive root. Sometimes you need to pay attention to the negative root. In this case, we're moving down when we hit the ground. That's our negative direction, so we should only be paying attention to the negative square root. We can use our calculator to find the square root of 303, which is 17.4. Approximately 17.4. The calculator will give you the positive root, but we know that what we really care about is the negative root. Uh, let's put our sign on that, meters per second. Uh, I don't remember if I've mentioned this before, but I want to uh, remind you that in these videos, I'm not really paying any attention to the issue of significant figures. I'm not trying to round my um, answers off to the correct number of significant figures. It's good to use the correct number of significant figures, but just for simplicity and clarity, I'm not covering that issue in these videos. So whenever I round something off in these videos, I'm just rounding, the, rounding it off to whatever feels good. Um, so you should not think that this is the right number of significant figures. I haven't worked that out for this problem. I just, just kind of felt natural to round this off to 17.4. All right, so if your instructor cares about significant figures, you'll have to learn about that someplace besides this series of videos. We're just rounding things off to whatever feels convenient. So what was the answer to the question? The velocity with which it strikes the ground is negative 17.4 meters per second. Now, of course, that's only going to be, make sense to your reader if they know that you chose up as the positive direction. So if you say that the final velocity is negative 17.4 meters per second, you better also have clearly indicated that you've chosen up as your positive direction. I think this problem introduced a lot of interesting issues um, that we should try uh, to review at this point. So um, let's see, a couple of the interesting issues. One thing is that, again, I think a lot of people might not have found the fastest way to do this problem. Uh, again, a lot of people might think that they really have to split this up into two problems. A lot of people might think that first they have to analyze the upward path, then they have to analyze the downward path. Um, but actually, it turns out um, that you can just do this whole thing in one fell swoop. Um, you don't need to do upward and then downward. What it comes down to is we really don't care about what happens at the peak here. Uh, because the peak was neither the initial nor the final point. All we really care about is what's happening at the initial and the final points when we're doing kinematics. That's a key lesson to put in your notes. When we're doing kinematics, all we really care about is what's happening at the initial and the final points. If you know what's happening at the initial and the final points, you can kind of ignore what's happening on the rest of the path. Um, so I think a lot of people here would have first tried to figure out what was happening at the peak. But the peak is neither our initial point nor our final point. Um, so it turns out we can ignore it. Now, it's possible to get this right if you split this up into, into more than one step, um, but it's good to see the fastest way of solving it. The fastest way to solve this is to ignore the peak and just do this in one step. Um, so if you go back to your systematic five-step method, remember the five-step method, step one was start by drawing the path. 
And one of the things that I mentioned you should do when you draw the path is indicate the initial and the final points. I hope that's something that you've been in the habit of doing, but this is one of the first questions we've done where we've seen how useful it is to be very clear in your mind about what the initial and the final points are. I've usually just been putting in dots for the initial and the final points, but because it was so important on this problem, I actually put the letter I to indicate the initial point and the letter F for the final point. That's actually not a bad habit. Um, if, you, if there's any doubt what the initial and the final points are, you can label the initial point with an I and a final point with an F. And one big advantage that we got from that is that we saw that the peak didn't matter. It didn't matter what was happening at the peak because the peak was neither the initial point nor the final point. And as we've just been discussing, you can solve a kinematics problem just by focusing on the initial and the final points. You don't have to focus on anything that's happening between the initial and the final points. So that was one big lesson here. We can do this problem in one step by just focusing on the initial point when we leave the cliff and the final point when we hit the ground. We don't have to separately figure out what happened at the peak because that was neither the initial nor the final point. So when you're doing step one and drawing the path, don't skip the step of indicating the initial and the final points. That can be really crucial for kinematics problems. And it's a good habit anyway because that's going to be very crucial when you go on to other problems later in physics as well. Anytime you're dealing with changes like displacement, which is the change in position, it's crucial to indicate the initial and the final points. Let's start getting into that habit right now. Um, let's see. Now, um, something that else that, that came through, I think, very clearly here was why we've been so um, conscious or even paranoid about the signs. You can start to see from this problem why it's important to really be paranoid about the signs, because that's one of the biggest sources of mistakes. Um, I think to many people, it might feel weird to say that the displacement was negative 15 meters. Uh, but hopefully you can get to the point where it doesn't feel weird. Uh, the displacement um, simply tells you how your position is changing. Well, in this case, our position was changing downwards. We started at the initial point on the cliff, and then ultimately we moved downwards to the final point. So our displacement was negative 15 meters if we choose up as our positive direction. That'll be clearer if you remember that displacement is not the same thing as distance. A distance can never be negative. A distance can never be negative. Remember, a distance is like what your odometer would read. Well, your odometer never reads a negative number. But a displacement um, can totally be negative. Um, if your displacement is in the positive direction, the displacement is positive. But if your displacement is in the negative direction, your displacement should be negative. Well, the best way to deal with the signs again is make sure that you're always thinking about the signs by always writing down the sign, not just in front of negative numbers, but also in front of positive numbers. If you always write down the sign, even in front of positive numbers, that forces you to always be thinking about the signs. And then you're more likely to pick up on uh, what the sign is on a more difficult problem, like the one that we just completed. Something else that was important here that we've seen on a few previous problems is that when you take a square root, you have to be conscious that your calculator is only going to give you the positive root. But you, need, or you are expected to know there's also a negative root. And then you have to decide, which roots should I pay attention to? Should I pay attention to the positive root? Should I pay attention to the negative root? Or should I pay attention to both roots? Which root you pay attention to just depends on the details of the problem. So you have to think about the problem to see which root makes sense. In this problem, only the negative root made sense because we knew we were moving down. On other problems, we might, we might want to use the positive root or maybe even both roots. 